<laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so we've got a sort of three episode tutorial this morning. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, there are breaks in the middle. Fortunately for, for both you and, and me. Uh, okay, so so far this week, we've been hearing a lot about various kinds of secured computations, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> um, as we've seen, moder modern cryptography offers a number of powerful tools, everything from zero knowledge to multi party computation to even things like program obfuscation and, um, uh, other, and, and beyond. Um, <clears throat> Broadly, what, what goes on in cryptography, at, at least sort of as we practice it now, uh, we specify, uh, you know, what it is that we want to reveal in some clear terms, often via a simulator or some other sort of fairly ideal model or some other fairly transparent device, and, uh, and then also specify the things that are supposed to stay secret from the adversary, and, and we sort of have a clear separation between, um, between what is supposed to be known and, uh, <clears throat> and what is supposed to be not visible to the adversary. So the, the model, the, a good model for sort of thinking about modern cryptography is uh, like the model for access to the, inf the contents of a conversation between a psychiatrist and a patient where there's a set of people who are supposed to be able to access the contents of that conversation and everybody else should know nothing. Okay. Um, what this type of line of research doesn't really answer is which computations should we be securing? Uh, so let me give you an example. Suppose we've got a multi-party computation protocol that allows me to compute the average salary uh, in a given university or department uh, and I do this computation twice, immediately before and after a given professor resigns. Okay. So though, even though you know, the protocol is revealing nothing more than it should, namely these two averages, it's pretty easy from these two averages to figure out exactly what Professor X's salary was um, at the time he resigned. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> That may not be apparent at the time you're designing a protocol for computing the average salary. Presumably, presumably if you're using a secure protocol, it's because you, you don't want to leak individual salaries. Okay. So today, what I'm going to be talking about is a setting where we have to sort of, we have to release some information, some data at the expense of others, uh, other kinds, and, and uh, in fact, the, sort of the the whole first hour of this tutorial, or first 50 minutes, is going to revolve around sort of thinking about even how to pin down the question of, of, of understanding, you know, how to, what, what information should, we, should, should be available and what should not, and how do we, how do we sort of try to draw a, a boundary in a situation where we don't have this kind of clear, bright line of who should know what, these clear, bright lines that tell us who should know what. Okay, so what what I'll be talking about, uh, or the setting I'll be, I'll be using for essentially the entire tutorial, with some exceptions, is uh, privacy in statistical data sets, so in st statistical databases. So imagine we've got a, um, <coughs> uh, a bunch of individuals who, who have their, their data, and uh, this data is being collected by some agency or, or you know, company or something, which we'll just call the curator, or very often just the algorithm that's processing the information. And uh, this curator, ha their goal is to make the, sort of make some kind of aggregate statistics about this, this data set as publicly available as possible. So maybe, you know, for government, for researchers, businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, the, sort of, Large collections of information, of course, are ubiquitous, and uh, a lot of these are collections of very personal information, things like, uh, well, census data and government surveys, uh, national security data, public health data, social networks, that kind of thing. Okay. So in these types of settings, you've got sort of on one hand, you're trying to make as much information as available as possible. On the other hand, um, if the information itself at the individual level is sensitive, then you've got, there's this kind of problem is that you can't just broadcast the data. 
So we've got this basic tension between utility on one hand, so users of the users who are on the outside want to be able to extract as much information as they can. Um, and uh, on, so on one hand, that's one goal. On the other hand, we've got a goal, the goal of some kind of privacy restriction that we want individual level information to stay hidden. And uh, so, th so th this is sort of the, the fundamental tension we're going to be uh, tussling with all morning. Uh, and <coughs> maybe the first question we should ask is how can we even pin down this question precisely? Okay. So just utility in some sense is what most of us are used to thinking about. If you ever take a class in statistics or machine learning, you spend a lot of time thinking about what, what is it exactly you're trying to get out of a data set. Um, <clears throat> privacy is less clear exactly what we should be aiming for. And uh, variations on this model have been studied since the 1960s in statistics and in the data mining and database literature and computer science broadly. Uh, and in the last decade plus, there's also been a lot of work in the theoretical computer science literature, which has really sought to place this area on uh, much more rigorous foundations than it had previously. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so I'll be... Um, Okay, so, so before we really get going, some caveats first. This is a tutorial. So uh, it's not a survey. In particular, it's incomplete. Don't even, I, I'm not even going to get close to a, an actual survey. Um, if I don't cite your or my work, uh, please forgive me unless I really screw up, then throw eggs and call me names and do whatever you should. Um, uh, like if I misattribute something, please please let me know. Uh, also, this is not a, like a one-way broadcast. Uh, even though it's being recorded, uh, we can still stop for questions and stuff. So, so really, like the purpose of this tutorial, this these talks, is to uh, for you guys who haven't seen this material before to learn something. So feel free to stop me. You can ask questions in English. You can ask questions in French, uh, and I'll be happy to answer either kind. Um, I have lots of material, probably more than I really have time to cover. I have no agenda in the political sense, meaning I'm happy to cover as much as makes sense. So uh, please, uh, please feel free to, to interrupt and ask questions and stuff. Okay, and then um, if, uh, if you don't feel like listening, uh, there are, uh, you know, and you want to read instead <laughs> or afterwards, uh, let me suggest three uh, really nice resources on this topic. One is uh, the book uh, by uh, Cynthia Dwork and Aaron Roth, which is sort of an ex somewhere between an extended tutorial and a textbook. Um, Salil Vadan has a, a survey that's about to come out uh, called on the complexity of differential privacy, or that's the current title, um, which, is, uh, which is very nice and which should be available soon, and you can probably get a copy from him if you ask politely. Um, and then uh, there are a number of tutorial videos out there. I highly recommend the ones from a Dimax workshop. Uh, actually, it's two, four years ago now, in 2012. But a lot of those uh, tutorials are still fairly fresh. Um, and there are lectures by Moritz Hart, Aaron Roth, Ben Pierce, Benjamin Pierce, and Jerome Micklau. And, they, and they're all um, excellent, actually. So, so those are, you know, for those of you who don't feel like reading, uh, and don't feel like listening today. Uh, <laughs> those are good. But actually, they cover things. That, a lot of them cover things I won't talk about. So, so they're, they're worth watching no matter what. OK, so today, three episodes, like we said. Um, so our, the fourth episode will be, call, will be sort of uh, setting up the problem, if you will, and also talking about uh, differential privacy. Um, Episode five will be uh, called The Curious Case of Counting Queries, although it's only about two-thirds of that episode, but uh, you'll, you'll explain, I'll explain what I mean when I get there. Uh, and episode six will be sort of on connections to other areas, so we'll try to branch out in the last hour and see why differential privacy has relationships to uh, other mathematical areas, uh, some of them uh, sort of nearby and some of them not so much. Okay. so uh, so. So first, first 50 minutes, uh, why is the, uh, kind of a, a, 
we'll start off by trying to understand why this problem is non-trivial to formalize in the first place. Um, and then we'll talk about this one formalization that's been proposed called differential privacy and try and understand you know, some of the pluses and minuses of this particular approach. Okay, so here's our uh, basic setup again. So let's try and un just to understand uh, what makes this problem challenging. Um, so one of the things th that makes it very hard to understand exactly what we're after is the availability of external information other than what you are uh, publishing directly as part of the outputs of this algorithm. Okay. In most of the time in crypto and in information theory, when something is secret, it is so secret that it doesn't matter what else is available, it doesn't change anything. So definitions like semantic security, for example, take care of that or just r are remain robust in presence of external information. Um, but in, in our case, we'll see it, it does play a role. Uh, users have external information sources, you know, the internet, maybe their own social networks, or perhaps other anonymized data sets, stuff like that. Uh, we, can't assume the no we, we can't assume that we, the designer of this algorithm A, know what is known to the users, never mind what they might know in the future. And so uh, we have to somehow be able to reason about it without really knowing exactly what it is. Okay. And uh, this makes, the, the, this availability of external information makes kind of any approach where you're tr trying to sort of anonymize data, where you're just trying to maybe remove names or obvious kind of do really simple things, uh, makes that kind of approach challenging and, and you know, as general rule is, uh, things that are claimed as anonymous, anonymized versions of a data set generally aren't. Okay, so let's see some examples. Uh, so we'll see a few kind of attacks that can happen on, on data sets. We'll talk about um, re-identification attacks, which are kind of the most obvious things, reconstruction attacks, membership tests, and a little bit about what I'll call correlation attacks, which are really in a different category, and I'll explain what I mean when we get there. <coughs> So let's talk about re-identification attacks. So here's an example. Uh, um, this comes from the work of, of uh, uh, Arvind Narayanan and Vitaly Shmatikov. In uh, 2006, there was a, a competition, m you may have heard about it, there was a competition run by Netflix for improving their recommendation sy uh, system. And they published, uh, as part of the competition, an anonymized data set, which consisted of um, movie review, so Netflix, if you don't know what it is, <laughs> is a movie rental service, essentially, um, that's online. So what they published was a, a data for where all, all the user information had been removed except for movie reviews themselves. So uh, they published sort of random IDs for a bunch of users, and for each of these random ID IDs, an associated list of movie reviews. Um, and that was, that was part of the data set of the competition. Um, what uh, Narayanan and Shmatikov noticed is that there was also a public data set which um, w came from a, a, data s a, d a website called IMDB where people discuss movies and usually under their real names and, and post comments and stuff. Uh, and so in, the, in this public data set, it, it is associated to real names. Now, the public data set is incomplete. People sort of publicly discuss a much smaller set of movies than they actually review on Netflix. But it was nonetheless possible for a large fraction of these users to confidently identify them, meaning to match the anonymous data set, which, was, which had reviews of lots of movies, uh, to the incomplete data set, which did not. Um, on average, it takes something like four movies to uniquely identify a user. I'm not, I can, can never remember exactly how they computed this statistic, but basically it comes from the fact that most of us watch some like unusual or rare movies that are basic, that identify us almost uniquely, a small subset of which identify us uniquely. Right, 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 so that, that's a good point. The reviews came with timestamps and, and actual like score, numerical scores. Um. <coughs> Right, good point. Okay, so, so the point was sort of, um, of course, we already, you already know these people's names here, but the, the point is that uh, 
you learn about all the movies, not, you learn not only about the movies that they chose to rate on IMDb in this public forum, but in fact about all the movies they rated, whether or not they felt like discussing these publicly. And uh, as you might imagine, what, you know, the movies you watch tell a lot about you. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so, there, it's a, so that's like a, a, a sort of classic example of a re-identification attack, and there are tons of others in the literature in all sorts of domains. Uh, social networks, computer network traces, micro-targeted advertising, recommendation systems, genetic data. Um, you can also do this based on, often you can pull off re-identification attacks based on combining poorly anonymized data sets that were anonymized independently. So for example, suppose you've got two hospitals and whose, po the, whose customer bases overlap, and there's, a, there's information published about independently by both hospitals about their, their customers, uh, then um, for a lot of the sort of proposed schemes out there, uh, anonymization schemes out there that don't come with some kind of careful reasoning, uh, you, can, you can combine these releases to uh, re-identify people or learn things about them that you shouldn't. And uh, there was a version of this slide I had a few years ago where I had like extensive citations on it, and at some point I ran out of space on the slide because there were sort of too many of these papers, so I just gave up. But uh, yeah, there are lots of them. <coughs> okay, so based on the examples we've seen, you might conjecture that the problem is granularity, right? Because all the, all the examples we've seen so far have been uh, Examples where what was released, or all the examples, I mean the example we've seen for so far has been a, uh, an example where you're releasing sort of individual level information in, in the Netflix case about the Netflix users. Um, and you might ask if the problem is exactly the fact that we're trying to release individual level information. What if we just release, uh, what if we only release aggregate information? Okay. Whatever aggregate means. And the issue is that defining this notion of aggregate is delicate. And let me give you a, a kind of an example. <coughs> uh, a support vector machine is a, is a particular, it's not a machine, it's, a, it's an optimization problem that's used to uh, fit, uh, uh, to d find a classifier to uh, points in, sp a linear classifier for points in space. So it finds, it attempts to find a, um, hyperplane that separates two sets of points. And uh, so it's, it's some kind of aggregate computation on, this, on an entire data set that finds as good a separator as possible under some measure. And so <coughs> you might think that the output of this program is something that's fine to release because it's, it's really telling you something about the data set as a whole and not any individual data point. But actually, if you sort of inspect it more carefully and if you look at the, the way the output is often specified in what's called the dual form, then uh, it's basically specified by giving a bunch of points that actually define this, uh, this hyperplane. So it's often specified by explicitly listing uh, a number of points that are actually in the data set, those that are closest to the boundary, essentially. And, um, and so even though it's the result of this very general computation, it's also telling you a lot about individuals in the data set. Okay. So that's one, one issue that can come up with aggregate statistics. Another is that statistics taken together can encode uh, a lot more data than is sort of at first apparent. Okay? And so there are a number of results on what I call reconstruction attacks, which have the flavor that if you release too many, too many sort of aggregate statistics that are too accurate in some sense, and the sense of accurate will vary across these results, then uh, it's possible to reconstruct the actual data set. And um, these attacks are robust even to a fair amount of noise. Uh, and they sort of, one of the interesting things about the, the, these attacks is that they tell us there's a fundamental trade-off, that if uh, if, we're gonna if we want to release a even aggregate level information, if, we if we're never going to be able to get everything we want. We're never going to be able to release accurate uh, answers to all sort of aggregate queries one might want to ask. Uh, 
because if we did so, we'd be we'd be basically be publishing the data set. Okay, so I'm going to work through a couple of examples or one example in detail here for this. And uh, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, I think it's sort of an interesting attack. It illustrates some nice connections to um, uh, the theory of solving noisy, um, noisy linear systems. Uh, but it's also going to provide us some lower bounds effectively on what we can do. And we're going to, as we try and develop algorithms that come with privacy guarantees, we're going to try to compare them to these bounds. Okay, so the example I'm working through is sort of hopefully serving a few purposes. Okay. So let's talk about an abstract setting, and then uh, I'll try and give you a couple of places where this abstract setting actually comes up. Okay. So the abstract setting is the following. We've got a data set with n people, and part of that data set is a secret vector, which we'll call z, or z. Uh, where, uh, depending on which side of the Atlantic you grew up on, um, where uh, Z has one bit per person, so uh, each each person gets one bit in the secret data in the secret vector, and th the data set could be a lot more than that, but we're just going to be concerned with the secrecy of this one vector. And what the attacker, what an attacker gets to see, what is released to the public, is uh, some vector of the following form, so there's some matrix Q, a 0, 1 matrix, which is known, uh, and the attacker gets to see um, some approximation to Q times Z. Okay. And uh, if you sort of look at this for a second, Q is M by N, Z is an N bit vector, so the, ans the entries of QZ are on a scale from 0 to N. Okay, because we're taking the inner product of an n-bit vector with an n-bit vector for each entry of, of qz. Uh, so we're going to normalize it by dividing by n, so we get numbers between 0 and 1. And then we're going to ask that the, um, so the adversary gets to see a noisy version of this, and the only requirement we're going to make is that the noise not be too large, that there's some parameter alpha that tells us that each of the entries of e is, is not too big. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, um, just the data may be more than, we'll see, uh, give, give me a slide and uh, it'll make more sense. So, yeah, for now, Z is the data set, sure. Um, okay, and the question we're going to ask is, on, uh, under what conditions on this matrix Q and this number alpha can the attacker reconstruct some estimate Z hat, which is close to Z in Hamming distance, meaning it agrees with Z in most of its entries. Okay, so we're going to look for... Uh, z vector z hat such that the Hamming distance between z hat and z uh, goes to z zero as a fraction of n. Okay. Okay, and so you know this is our this is the setup in a in a just like a little tiny box, and we'll, the little tiny box will follow us from slide to slide. Okay, so um, wow, that, sorry, the animation screwed up. But this was supposed to appear kind of in pieces, I'm sorry, it's like a lot of information at once. Um, <coughs> so one example where this comes up is where the data set, for each person we have many attributes, only one of which is actually considered sensitive or secret. So this comes up in settings where they, I've got a, a, a data set and, and part of it is sort of inherently public, like um, the list of people in the data set is known, and maybe their names and you know, demographics are known and we've got some secret vector that we care about. So, <coughs> so uh, each person's data is going to be d plus 1 bits in this picture. And for each person, I know d bits, which is a row of a, and, um, this, uh, and then one secret bit, which is the entry of z. And uh, for various types of releases about a data set like this, I can think of what is revealed about Z as giving me a bunch of linear constraints, noisy linear constraints on Z, even if what's revealed is, is itself noisy. So for example, suppose what's being revealed are pairwise correlations between attributes. Um, so then what's essentially going on, if I'm revealing the correlation between the secret attribute and each of these public attributes, 
then what I'm revealing is exactly uh, some noisy inner product between uh, each column AJ of this matrix and uh, the secret vector Z. And so what the attacker learns is this noisy inner product, uh, okay, which will normalize by n plus or minus some kind of error. And uh, the attacker learns this for each of the public attributes, for each of the d public attributes. Okay, so we can think of what the attacker is learning in this setting as a transpose z plus some noise if, if the statistics that are released are not perfectly accurate. Okay. Um, what happens if I'm releasing maybe, so that's one example. Uh, another example is if I'm releasing sort of three-way statistics among uh, sort of more complicated information. So like for, for example, one thing I might want to do is um, for each triple of attributes give, tell you a marginal table of how that triple behaves in the data set. And then what I'll get is um, sort of if you think through what, uh, if, I, if, I'm if what I'm, one of the things I'm revealing is the number of people in the data set such that, um, So the marginal statistics would give me, for each, for each triple of attributes, uh, the number of people who have all those attributes set to 1, two of those attributes set to 1, and 1 to 0, et cetera. So in particular, I'd, I'd be learning this quantity, which is the, or some noisy approximation to it. And if you think about what this is, this is the inner product between um, z on one hand and some vector, which is uh, some kind of weird outer product between uh, AJ and AL, which consists of, uh, of uh, not, sorry, not some weird outer product, but sorry, some product of a AJ and AL, a pointwise product of AJ and AL, where uh, I, I get a 1 if both of these attributes are set to 1 and a 0 if in all other cases. Okay. Uh, notice that, <coughs> so I get, an, each of these types of information gives me sort of an inner product. In this case, for d attributes, I'll get d, d choose two such inner products, right? So I'm getting a much, so my, my vector of queries, my vector q is now much bigger. Um, uh, but again, I can sort of think of this as a noisy linear combination now with, with d choose two queries. Okay, and then something that's sort of less obvious is actually for various types of um, optimization problems you might want to solve on a data set like this. Like for example, if you're fitting a, a statistical model to the data and releasing the parameters of that statistical model, very often these also reveal um, linear constraints on the data. And uh, I guess I, I was going to work through the example, but I'll just keep moving. Uh, <coughs> essentially what happens is if, I, if, if I'm releasing the, the parameters of some model, I'm telling you that the gradient evaluated on this data set, the gradient of the model is zero, uh, the gradient of some loss function is zero at those parameters, and, uh, or approximately zero if I'm giving you an approximate solution. And uh, that, that basically gives you a linear constraint. You can derive from that linear constraints on, on Z, okay, when you know A. Okay, so these sort of, these systems of, of noisy linear constraints come up like in lots of, for lots of different releases that you, things you might want to release about a data set like this. Let me give you one other example where this comes up because this is, well, for a few reasons, but one of them it's going to be relevant later. Um, here's another setting where you get this. Suppose what, suppose my, my vector z is not actually really part of the data set, uh, but what my attacker knows is a superset of the actual data set. Okay, so Maybe my attacker knows everybody at the university and the data set concerns only women at the university. Okay, or, well, that's probably a bad example. Uh, sorry, let me try that again. Everybody at the university, the data set is, consi consists only of, uh, you know, students who've uh, 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 been involved in uh, reporting uh, violence or something like that, a crime against them. Okay. So here, the, the matrix A is some superset the rows are, where the rows are people who might be in the data set. And the vector Z is an indicator vector show, telling me who's actually in the data set. Okay, so I can think of this as, I can think of my data set X as a product of some diagonal matrix of the Z's. Uh, 
uh, times a, or I can just sort of think of z as a mask where uh, the, all, all the places where z is 0, those rows have been pulled out of the data set. OK, so now if I were to release uh, even very simple statistics about this data set, like the marginal, the, in, the single column marginal statistics, like how many ones are there in each of these columns, then uh, I can think of this because these, the, um, I, I can think of these columns as telling me uh, the product of A times Z. Um, where, or, yeah. And uh, so <coughs> the, uh, sorry, that's A transpose Z. There's a transpose missing. Um, and again, so if I'm getting approximate statistics, marginal statistics about this data set, then I'm getting linear constraints on this membership vector. And in particular, if I can reconstruct the membership vector, I, I'm figuring out who's in the data set and who's not. Okay, that, that's the title of the slide. Um, and similarly, with the, so this is for, with the example I just gave you is for sort of simple column sums, but th that works for pretty much any of the other things we were talking about on the previous slide. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about this type of attack later, but this is sometimes called sort of a membership attack, right? Because I'm trying to figure out who's in the data set, who's not. Yeah, Manoj. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, the short answer is everything here is over the reels. So it's not hard. Yeah? So if I was being totally unintentional, uh, if I get the choice of Q, maybe yeah. Q could be a real matrix and Z is sparse, and it's just the best sense of problem. Yeah, so I, I was going to uh, get, uh, yeah, so uh, I was going to get there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, OK. Uh, at but this point, natural, at this point, now we can now sort of think Mathematically, what's the question up here? Well, we're solving some noisy linear system. It turns out that there are like hundreds of years of work on this, right? So we don't have to figure it out all ourselves. Uh, the um, specifics of this setting make it sometimes a little different from the sort of classic results. But yeah, uh, we can apply, and people have indeed applied uh, lots of sort of classic theory. One interesting thing here is that generally we're in a setting where we don't choose the matrix, right? In the, the two examples I gave you, the matrix is determined by the data. So one of the things all you would, one would want to know is, do the matrices that make this linear reconstruction problem easy to solve, do they actually arise naturally? Or, or okay. I'm not going to get to that, but the short answer is yes. You know, essentially, random matrices do great. OK. Um, so OK, so, so let's. Uh, uh, <coughs> all right, so let's. Pause for a moment. <laughs> no peeking. All right. And uh, let's ask how well we can solve this problem that we talked about. So we've got so we've got this basic linear system, and we'd, we'd like to understand under what conditions we can reconstruct a good approximation to z. Okay. So let's start with a, a simple example, but uh, an important one is what if q contains all the possible you know, binary vectors one might want to ask about. OK, so one, one setting is where m is equal to 2 to the n, and q has all possible rows. Right, so in that case, what we're doing is we're, what I'm giving you is noisy linear no, sorry, noisy answers to all the possible questions you might want to ask about z. I mean, all the questions that have this form. Right? Okay, so the question is how. Uh, so what? Are, again, what we know is that we've got some bound on the uh, the quality of the answers we're getting. Okay, where al here alpha is a, a number between zero and one. So remember, we've normalized things. So the entries of well, all of these vectors are going to be between 0 and 1. Okay. So <coughs> what is a, uh, what's a good, like, what's an attack we could carry out? What, what, can we, what can we do with this type of information? Well, one thing we, know, one, one thing we can notice is that for every, for every candidate data set W, for every candidate for Z that we might want to consider, we can estimate the Hamming distance 
between w and z using exactly these types of queries. Okay, so for, um, if we think, think about what the Hamming distance between w and z is, well, it's the inner product of z with some vector that tells me where w has a 1 and where, uh, uh, yeah, where w has a 1. So this is Uh, sorry, not where W has a 1, but where W has a 0. Right, so these are the, the places where they, um, where this is the number of places where W is 0 and Z is 1, right? And uh, the other inner product is uh, sort of the other, uh, the other thing, so this is, You can write it like this. Right? So we can, we've can we got the, uh, the, the combination of, <clears throat> well, OK. These positions, I'm going to sort of write this out um, a little differently. So the places where. Uh, so I, I can think of these as sort of giving me, well, various linear, I can write this in terms of inner products with z of various vectors. I'm actually going to write it a little bit differently, which is I'm going to write it in terms of w minus z. So w minus z is, um, is going to have ones or minus ones where w and z differ and zero everywhere else. Right, so this is the inner product of some vector I don't know, which is the places where w is 1 and z equals 0 with this vector, uh, plus sort of a symmetric thing in z, z minus w, which is the places where z equals 1 and w equals 0, right? So now I've, I've written it sort of in terms of uh, things that tell me about w minus z. In particular, this is equal to, uh, this is at most twice twice the, uh, <coughs> the, L, the, the infinity norm of, of Q times W minus Z. Okay? So, <coughs> so basically, what, what, I'm, what we're saying is that the, the Hamming distance between W and Z is, is bounded very closely by the um, distance between the, the, the infinity norm of the distance between the answers on W and the answers to all my questions on Z. Right? And so <coughs> what is my sort of what's going to be my attack? Well, my attack is just going to take the, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to output Z hat, which is the, The minimizer, so I don't know how to minimize q w minus q z, but for any given w, I can compute q w, and for z, I've got I've got some estimates y of q z, right? So I can just use this thing instead. I'll try, so basically, what I'm doing is I'm looking for the w, which whose answers are as whose vector of answers is as close as possible to uh, the, the the things I know, the approximations I know. And the question is, how good is, is z? Well, the Hamming distance between these two guys, we said it's, um, <coughs> it's at most twice the q of z hat minus z, which is at most um, so I've got at most twice the error between um, <coughs> 
well, just by the triangle inequality, the, the, the magnitude of z, q times z hat minus z is at most q z hat minus y plus q z, q z minus y, right? And now uh, q z hat was chosen to make the first term as small as possible. In particular, it's smaller than the term on the right. And so all of this is less than 4 times the term on the right, which is at most alpha, but assumption. So what this tells us is that the, um, the quality of my estimate is going to be, uh, it's going to be, uh, sorry, this is alpha uh, n. Sorry, I, lost a factor of n on the way. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so, so what I know is y, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick the w that fits y as well as possible. And it turns out that the error is going to be uh, going, is going to be proportional to the, the, the number of disagreements between z hat and z is going to be proportional to uh, my error alpha. And in fact, if I kind of think of it as a fraction of the entries of z, it's going to be small whenever alpha is small. So whenever I'm providing accurate answers to queries, I'm getting an accurate reconstruction. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Uh, so for the sparse case, you, you got to work differently. Uh, but you would optimize over, uh, over sparse z, over sparse w's, right? And uh, notice that in the sparse case, this guarantee is just not very interesting. Like I can, I could, in the sparse case, all of the answers are going to be close to zero. So I can always answer with something that's close to zero, right? Uh, so in the sparse case, you have to work through a different, like you want to normalize everything differently and we're, we're just not going to do that. Uh, yeah? Uh, is the argument over all binary uh, that's a gr good question, but uh, neither is reading all of the all of y. Uh, so actually, what we're it turns out that so in the form I specify said you know just just telling you y is uh, you know two to the n bits, and so you know taking time to the n you know what's the problem? You're already reading your input. Uh, hold on to that question because we'll talk about efficiency in a sec. Yeah. Uh, right, so so like I said, so it turns out that there are, these attacks are generally efficient, and I'll explain. Not always, but I'll, I'll explain. I'm not, okay, so uh, the I'm not going to get into like the kind of details of the difference, but basically uh, uh, there there yeah there is something to be said there, and I'll I'll say just a touch about it in uh, one slide. Okay, so <clears throat> so one might ask how so so this is just a summary of what we just did. Um, and the only thing I wanted to point out about it, sorry, was that um, this requires a lot of, of a lot of information, right? It seems like this attack, as specified, um, requires tons of information to carry out. Okay, turns out if you think about it a little bit, it it actually all you really need to do is to kind of solve some sort of a some some approximation problem. So you're really looking for uh, one or two queries in this big matrix Q that kind of line up, best line up with Z. And uh, so kind of hang on to that thought because we'll, we'll use that as a lower bound at some point uh, in hour two. Uh, but <coughs> uh, yeah, for now, just notice this requires a lot of queries, which is or a lot of you know, a lot of statistics, which is maybe not good, and, of, and as you said, a lot of time. All right, so, um, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, um, so let, let's go a little more in, into this and say, well, what if, what if, uh, what if M is much smaller? Okay, what, if, what do we do when, when the number of entries is, is closer to N? So, we can generalize the approach we just took and say, well, one of the, you know, 
uh, one of the, what we'd like to do is we've we've got you know some some matrix. It's now it's not clear we're getting quite as in, uh, much information as we were before, but a natural strategy anyway is to whoa, is to look for the uh, look for a candidate W, which is as close to Y as possible as measured by the answers to these queries for some uh, vector for some uh, for some in, under some norm, maybe the infinity norm, maybe not. And uh, it turns out that there are uh, attacks of this form have been analyzed. And notice that I've sort of carefully now allowed my W to be a little more general. Sorry, uh, the bound on the right should be a 0, not a minus 1. So that should be from 0 to 1, 0, 1 to the n. Um, and a, a kind of a rough rule for these types of attacks in a bunch of settings is that as long as the number of an, as long as the number of queries is super linear, not necessarily super linear, but at least some constant in n, at least as large. So I'm getting as many constraints as I have things I'm trying to figure out. And this matrix Q is somehow nice, in a sense we'll sort of try to pin down in a sec, then um, this Hamming distance goes to zero, the relative Hamming distance goes to zero. Roughly whenever alpha, alpha the accuracy level, is less than one over square root of n. So not Necessarily const, not, not necessarily anything going to zero, but anything going to zero sufficiently quickly. Okay. And uh, this is getting to Anand's question earlier. The, sort of the analysis of these types of uh, attacks is really has these beautiful connections to compressed sensing among, amongst other areas. And uh, you might ask what nice is. So the, the right answer to the question about what's nice is called, uh, is defined by some quantity called uh, discrepancy or partial discrepancy of this matrix Q. Um, in some cases, uh, it's, it's given by you know, various linear algebraic properties, these sort of what are called restricted isometry properties. Uh, but anyway, this has been sort of under analyzed in a bunch of settings. And in particular, random matrices satisfy this, the types of connections we need. Uh, Random conjunction matrices, so those the types that come up in these multi-way statistics satisfy this requirement. Uh, the Hadamard matrix uh, is a really nice example, which I was hoping to work through, but I guess I won't have time. Um, and uh, <coughs> so what we get is that the um, we, we get the sort of two regimes. So when the number of queries is uh, 2 to the n, then we get reconstruction that goes to 0 like right away. And when the number of queries is more modest, more, sort of polynomial, then we get uh, an er re reconstruction that goes to 0 as long as alpha uh, squared is going to 0 at a rate of 1 over n. And so this gives us some breathing room between these. And what we'd like to be able to do is to find algorithms that can answer lots of queries uh, with some meaningful privacy guarantees, but where my uh, alpha is going to be kind of hopefully clo as close to 1 over square root of n as I can get it. Did I s Yeah, sorry. It was a 1 over that got so killed. You know, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, there you're making assumptions of like Z, the class of Z. So some Zs are easier to estimate than other Zs. Mm -hmm. And so you get, you know, k log n is the Z is k sparse. Yeah. Right, so uh, I would say you know you one can ask lots of questions of this form, you know, depending on various extra constraints on Z. What can I say? I don't think that's been fully explored. Although in the compress for constraints like sparseness, that's that's well understood, and uh, I'm not going to go into that too much. Just sort of, I'm going to stick with uh, with this level of of precision for now. OK, so uh, I was going to give you some details on one of these uh, attacks, but I think I'm, I'm just, because I'm essentially um, out of time for this, this part of the talk, I'm, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to sort of borrow a little, a few minutes from the next talk, uh, because I, I want to uh, kind of end at a natural stopping point, and I'm just borrowing from myself. But uh, you know, I'm sorry if, if this uh, delays coffee by a minute or two. OK, so we talked about these reconstruction attacks where you can kind of reconstruct the entire vector. Uh, turns out that much more 
Um, generally, we can do things like membership testing. And uh, let me give you an example of that, of sort of a, another place where this comes up, and again, a place where we're going to get a lower bound that we'll be kind of coming up against later, coming up tightly against later. Um, so uh, Homer et al., Ho uh, Niels Homer and others in 2008 published a paper. They were looking at uh, what you could figure ab out about who is in a clinical study based on the summary statistics that were published about that study. Okay? And what they observed is that exact high dimensional summaries of a data set allow an attacker with some knowledge of the population that the data set came from to test membership in that data set. Okay. And uh, membership itself, as we said earlier, it can be sensitive, right? So for example, you know, um, uh, it, first of all, okay, it's not specific to genetic data. You can imagine lots of places where membership in, on a list is sensitive. Um, but actually, with these types of clinical studies, often the, the statistics are segregated by, you know, whether or not you have some particular disease or not, right? In which case, the, sort of which of the two sub-data sets you're in tells a lot of information. Um, and uh, recently, there's been a fair amount of work in uh, literature on sort of strengthened versions of these membership tests. And John Ullman is going to talk about that in, um, in more detail in his talk on Friday. Uh, and something that kind of falls into the same broad category, sort of like there's a recent, um, a recent uh, work by Fredrickson and others showing how you can sort of reconstruct, you can basically test if a particular person's face was used for training a face recognition model, even though when one, on, the only thing that's released are the parameters of the model and not the actual the training data. Okay, so basically we're asking when can you figure out if a person is in the training data. Um, and I guess I will, I'm going to work through the sort of the, the specifics enough because I need to use it later. Uh, so imagine, I've, imagine my data set is a set of n binary vectors over, so I've got d uh, attributes per person. And I'm going to assume that they come from some distribution p, some underlying population p, and that they're sampled iid from that population. Now, what I get to see is, uh, sorry, this should be a capital Q, QX, which is just X bar, the, um, simply the column averages for this set X. So these are just the proportion of ones in each column. And um, we're going to imagine there's a vector Z. This is not the same Z as before. Z here is a target vector. So Z is the data of a particular person, Alice. And I'm trying to figure out if she's in the data set or not. So I don't need to know the entire data set. I just know one row, and I'm trying to figure out if that row is present or not. Okay. So Eve, Eve knows uh, x bar. She knows this target data set z, which is either a, a row from the data set or a fresh sample from the population. And uh, she also gets some side information about the population, namely a bunch of fresh samples from the population, so other people's data. Uh, and what um, Homer et al. and sort of more formally Sankaram et al. showed is that Eve will, can reliably guess if um, Alice is in the data set as long as the number of attributes, again, is larger than uh, the number of um, people in the data set. Okay. And one can generalize this uh, as follows. You can sort of ask, well, what happens when Eve just gets an approximate answer? So she gets approximate proportions for some alpha that's smaller than 1. So now she knows x bar plus a, uh, plus or minus alpha sort of in each of the entries. And again, the same information as before, same other information as before. And she can reliably guess if uh, Alice is in the data set as long as, again, the number of attributes grows quicker than n, or is at least some constant times n. And as long as the error is at most uh, some number of the form um, square root of d over n. So in particular, when the number of attributes I'm considering is quadratic in the data set of the data size of the data set, which is a common sort of regime for uh, genetic studies where you can have numbers of attributes in the hundreds of thousands to millions and data set sizes in the hundreds, which sort of is like an extreme example, then, uh, you're, uh, then um, 
basically this this number is very this number is very large and your alpha it just has to be smaller than some constant. I, I guess there's a, there's a minimum of th this term and, and a small constant here. Okay, so John Ullman will talk about this result and, and various other things in his talk, but uh, the thing to remember is that our accuracy uh, won't be able to grow faster than this sort of square root of the number of queries over n, and again, we're sort of gonna come up against that bound uh, next hour. Okay. So, uh, let me say one, one, more, uh, one more thing. Um, so one, one, more, one more type of thing to keep in mind are what are called uh, correlation attacks. And I put attacks in quotes here because these are really very different from the things we've seen so far. And I want to kind of spell them out explicitly because, again, they're going to be useful for us. Suppose that you know that I smoke and you read some public health study that tells you that I am at risk for cancer, okay? Meaning that smokers are at risk for cancer. Not that I specifically am at risk for cancer, but you learn that smokers are at risk for cancer. Uh, so that tells you that I, in particular, am at risk for cancer. And uh, so maybe you decide not to hire me or uh, charge me more for insurance or whatever it is. Okay. So what's going on? So there was a study that used sort of people's sensitive medical information to uh, glean some information about, you know, humans, human biology. Uh, but as a result, you learned something really very much about me. You learned that I, uh, you know, I'm at risk for higher risk for cancer than the average person. So in some sense, you learned about me not really by learning about the data set per se, but by learning something about the underlying population that was being studied. Okay. Notice that you know, in this example, it doesn't matter whether or not I was in the study. You know, the study could have been done in, in um, you know, Canada, even though I no longer live there. Okay. Um, and in fact, any representative data set f that is representative for this population that we're trying to study will do. Okay. And it turns out that a lot of the literature that is sort of, the, a number of things that are discussed as attacks in the literature fall into this category. And uh, so there are things that where you learn about a person by learning about the underlying population. Okay? So uh, for example, there are things called Diffinetti attacks that were defined and, and membership inversion, various other terms that were thrown around. Um, and uh, the thing I want to point out is that this type of attack, you, you can call it an attack if you will, is fundamentally different from all the other things we're discussing so far. So all the other things we're discussing so far, you're really learning about the people in the data set. In this type of situation, uh, you're learning things that don't rely or imply anything about individual data, and there's a sense in which they are these types of attacks are provably impossible to present in it by, with any reasonable release of information. Okay, so, uh, so we saw re-identification attacks, reconstruction attacks, membership tests, correlation attacks. We'll sort of come back to these, as I said, later. But what, of the, what are the lessons we've learned? Well, that too many too accurate statistics allow one to reconstruct the data. And the notion of aggregate is very hard to pin down. Okay. And so what we'll do in the second 50 minutes is uh, we'll sort of try and look at a specific concept, a specific attempt at doing this called differential privacy. We'll see some examples and basic properties, and then we'll get into uh, very, a, a number of algorithms that actually uh, satisfy this notion and come up against those bounds we were talking about earlier. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, let's take a break. Okay. You don't have to applaud after each. <laughs>